Having established himself as a director of note with Pan's Labyrinth, Guillermo del Toro entered into somewhat of a production hell as he wandered from project to project trying to find something that the studios were willing to greenlit, a surprising situation, especially considering the warm critical response that Pan's had received. First of all, his, uh, back in 2006, teaming up with Travis Betcham, the uh, the parent had been working on a fantasy screenplay called Killing on Carnival Row, which ultimately came to nothing. And through this uh, frustration, the two managed to come up with a concept to Pacific Rim. But during this time, it would be passed around from studio to studio, and Del Toro would go on to work on the now mythical At the Mountains of Madness, which to this date still remains in development hell, before finally returning to Pacific Rim and creating... What can best be seen as a love letter to kaiju, kaiju movies and certainly the cin- cinema such as like Godzilla and Gamera, which Dotor has openly been uh, been opening his love for. And certainly this uh, shows as we when we look at the film, here we have a $190 million love letter to these movies in which humanity is put under, put under attack by giant monsters in turn creating giant robots to battle said monsters as we get a very pacifist view of monsters versus robots battles but would this be too niche would this be the sort of film that would fail to strike an audience with the summer blockbuster crowd i'm elwood i'm kim and you listen to movies and tea let's take it to the booth Okay, uh, we are tonight going to be talking about Pacific Rim from 2013. We're now getting almost the end of the Del Toro journey. And I think here we've got tonight, we're looking at a film which is kind of unique because it's very different from anything else that we've talked about so far in the Del Toro catalog. I mean, everything else has sort of had this very sort of horror slant and here is his first attempt to do sort of do something more sort of like Kaiju and action cinema related, which is certainly a unique move for Del Toro, but certainly when we look at his influences, I think it was something that uh, we should have expected him to eventually get around to making. And Pacific Rim, I mean, it's a film that came out of nowhere, immediately struck a chord with all the Kaiju fanboys, such as myself, and uh, somehow managed to reel in this summer blockbuster crowd as well as the appeal of giant robots fighting bigger monsters really uh, seemed to be what we all wanted to go and see back in 2013. Tonight, uh, we are, it's not just myself and Kim, as uh, we are also going to be doing a bit of cross-pollination between the shows. And uh, I'd like to obviously welcome to the show tonight, Stephen, you know, Guilo Rambling's World Tour and the Asian Cinema Film Club. Hello, everybody. So, Stephen, I mean... When it comes to Del Toro, are you a fan or do you sort of step in and out? Where do you sort of stand? I'm a huge fan of Del Toro. Um, I think it's fair to say he's one of the directors who could put something out and I will go and see it at the cinema. Um, certainly been true of everything sort of since Hellboy, I would say. Um, but actually, I'm probably more a fan of his Spanish language work um, rather than his... Uh, Sort of the, the sort of the early horror stuff he was doing at Hollywood, but Pacific Rim obviously took it to a slightly different place and a different level. And I just remember seeing the first trailers come out, and I guess I was one of those fanboys because I couldn't bloody wait. <laughs> yeah, and Kim, I mean, obviously, you know, t- tonight we're moving away from horror. We're talking, as I said, this is real kaiju territory that we're in tonight. So. Where did it, would, do you have any interest in seeing this film before? Or is this sort of, where did you sort of stand when it came to Pacific Rim? Um, well, no, I wanted to see it. Uh, it wasn't because <laughs> of Kaiju, um, because I don't know much about it. I actually have a ton of questions because I'm watching it a second time and I'm seeing all these things that I forgot the first time <laughs> that I saw it. Um, yeah, so, no, I, I like it because I really like the the style and the visuals. And at that point, I believe I had already um, been really interested in Del Toro because I had seen Pan's Labyrinth and um, other stuff that I don't remember right now, what else I saw after that. Um, so, yeah, no, I mean... I was really interested in seeing it, and I didn't see it in theaters, though. I ended up seeing it, I don't know, on Netflix or on My Friend Lend It To Me or something like that. I can't remember right now. I mean, myself, I mean, 
just when I remember when this uh, film came out, and it was ironic because I never actually got a chance to see it in the cinema, which was kind of a, a shame. And and it was sort of like a home viewing. Just one Christmas, I actually uh, sat and watched it. And I think really from those opening scenes, and this is something the film really does a great job of establishing. It establishes its whole mythology and its whole world really within its opening narration as we're basically uh, thrown into this very sort of grounded world where Kaiju have never existed um, until they just suddenly suddenly appear and the, all the human forces have is just sort of traditional military technology and it they believe it's just sort of at least one off occurrence and then obviously it turns out not to be and several months down the line another Kaiju appears and then another and it causes all the world governments to come together and put their money into creating Jaeger technology, which are these giant robots, and they prove to be sort of the ultimate uh, weapon that can help defeat these kaiju. And from this from this point, we go from the point where the Jaegers are considered this, like this, what all the what the, all the worlds are willing to invest in, to the point where the whole program is just close to being scrapped. It's just a handful of Jigas that uh, that remain. And instead, the world governments are putting their investments into creating a giant wall for some reason. Um, so, I mean, with the just looking at the opening, I mean, how did it work for you guys in terms of world, world building? So I really liked how it sort of set it out. I mean, the idea that giant pilots they would become like these rock star sort of figures as we got used to obviously the idea of kaiju that we they'd be worked into sort of pop culture so you had to be see uh in the opening that you know they get like trainers and uh fashion based on giant on uh, kaiju which is pretty amusing to see and how did uh the opening work for you guys though I think they, I think the opening is good. Um, like it really sets its grounds really well. It sounds it sets the foundation of how everything is and it kind of like gives you this basis of, um, like, our main character at, at the same time. Um, I mean, the only thing I didn't really enjoy about it was, like, I think it, it had to do with the whole thing was that I'm, I'm I have my issues with um, Charlie Hunam. Okay. Um, mostly because I just, I hate people who talk like that. <laughs> who have this, like, gruffy kind of, like, voice that sounds like you're watching Christian Bale's Batman and, and that pisses me off um it gets me really annoying annoyed because I have to put on subtitles because I can't understand what they're saying um so no that was the only complaint I had about it but everything from like the setup and everything uh, yeah. everything else that kind of built it 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 worked for me uh pretty good okay yeah I I, I think it worked brilliantly in fact I remember when I first saw it I sort of came out of cinema wishing there was a prequel. I wanted to know more about that first five minutes because there were so many fantastic ideas in there. So it sort of set it up. But it, the, the, the thing I love about this film is the world building, the amount of effort that goes, that's goes that gone into creating this world. And and that, that first five minutes is absolutely fantastic in sort of some of the ideas it throws out. It doesn't do anything with any of them, but it just sort of throws them out there. And I think it shows a sort of a level of imagination and the amount of work that went into this movie in just building building that world, as Kim said, um is 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 quite astonishing. I also got a problem with Charlie Hunam, who I think is one of the dreariest leading men ever. But um <laughs> um yeah, there we go. Okay. I think one of my favourite shots of that opening is that when they're showing how the technology works, because um, you just assume, we, I think we all sort of grew up in this culture, especially if you're a fan of like Tup- Tup- uh, Tokusetsu, sort of like the uh, sort of shows like uh, Ultraman and Power Rangers and, and and like Gundam, these things where we've got like giant robots. We've all good use of like just the one guy piloting this huge robot. And what I love about Del Toro's vision is the fact that the human mind apparently is not strong enough to deal with trying to pilot a huge robot. So we see like people like, like these pilots being burnt out because they can't stand the mental stress. So uh, to pilot the coaches, you've got to be mentally linked with your co-pilot. And in the original script, there's a lot more fun things that they did with it, such as, um, Charlie Hunnam's character, Raleigh, and um, Rico Kidgey's 
uh, character, Mako, uh, they would both speak their native tongue. And it was only by them drifting together that they were able to learn each other's languages because they're obviously shown this uh, mental sort of concept. And it's a shame that those little details uh, were sort of scrapped from the plot. But we do get a lot of really cool looking shots of text, such as the guy uh, with the arm. And you can see in the background how it's been mirrored by the uh, Jager. I love all those shots. And certainly when it comes to shooting, Kaiju Del Toro really has got the eye for it. Because if you're shooting giant monsters, you can't shoot them sort of side on you have to shoot them from low level to give it all the concept of like size and scale and i think right from the start he just absolutely nails the scale that the world has to be set in so you never feel like you're watching a bunch of action figures sort of bouncing around the screen everything has got like sort of real sort of size and presence to it um and just when you see that opening shot of like the kaiju bashing through like the golden gate bridge i was just i just had a complete fanboy moment when i saw that it was sort of like you get used to seeing these sort of visuals with like uh sort of like the, the traditional sort of like Godzilla movies, the men in suit uh, films, and then you see what's possible with decent CGI. Um, sort of the freedom it, it, it creates here and when you combine that with like the practical elements which we'll obviously talk about in a bit, um it, it is just really fantastic work that Del Toro Del Toro has put into film. And you can tell that he loves this genre. Just like all the little details that he's put into it and all the mechanics of this this world, um, which I think a lot of people, a lot of the snark casters out there bash, and it's I never understood why. I mean, it it well, everything that we see in this world seems to work perfectly within the rules of this this world. But you know, I think that I think that's one of my one of my biggest questions is because, like, I know I don't know if Steven's really good at kaiju, but I, I know that I was really good at it, and and like um, I don't know anything, honestly. Like when so the, Elwood, the, Elwood tries to get me into Kaiju. Once a year. <laughs> once a year we hold Kaiju Christmas. I don't Every Christmas. You... <laughs> yeah. So, because the thing is, you know, I was thinking about, like, the fact that a lot of the scenes in, um, like, when they start the movie, they, they kind of give you this thing, like, oh, Kaiju means monster in Japanese. Yes. But then, you know, when you talk about Kaiju movies, is it just really monsters? Because I always feel like when people talk about Kaiju films, they always talk about Godzilla. And that's, like, kind of the link I had with it. And then I was like, well, is it something more? So that came to the question of, for me, it's more of, like, is it... Because here, he, like, I find it really smart to do it, but I don't know if, like, the original concept is, like, that kaiju is aliens, or is it just because these aliens are monsters that they're called... It's considered, like, a kaiju film. Yeah, I mean, kaiju means strange beast. So basically anything that is a large... Uh, monster be it from space or earthbound so if we, we have got like monsters like godzilla and rodan who are sort of like based on earth and then we've got space monsters such as like king Ghidorah and gigan and the old classes kaiju because the giant monsters that are basically stomping on tokyo uh but so basically if it's a giant monster then uh that can be classed as a as a kaiju uh, okay. so and uh yeah that's a that's, I think that's the easiest sort of way to to describe it. Because it, basically, as it says in the opening, like, uh, Kaiju means strange beast. And um, Jaeger, which is the German word for hunter, mm-hmm. um, is obviously in reference to the robots. So. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, if, you, if you've got um, a giant giant monster um, in, in Asian cinema, particularly Japanese cinema... Um, then that will that they they're classed as um, they're classed as Keishu. Um So there's, it's not just limited to to Godzilla. I mean, there's obviously you've got Gamera, who's his own okay. sort of universe as well, who's a giant fire-breathing space turtle, who's also the friend to all children. Um, okay. And even like uh, King Kong is uh, considered Kaiju. He's got his own version in the Toho universe. Um, he, there's a couple of films. There's even a Mechani Kong, um, who he battles in uh, King Kong Escapes. So there's that to enjoy as well. <laughs> Lots to catch up on in the kaiju world. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. But I mean, like, I think like going back to this is like the kaiju film and using like that whole the breach and um, them being kind of like aliens in a certain way kind of reminded there was some parallels here like the the jaggers reminded me a lot of um you know that scene in 
is it Aliens 2, where, yeah. like, Ripley is trying out those machines, um, you know, those, those oh, fighting... Yeah, 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 I don't remember the word. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I thought, I thought, I saw that parallel in there, and I thought it was pretty smart. I don't know if it was deliberate or not. So, so Del Toro is also, he's not just drawing on kaiju movies, he's also drawing on the, on the mecha sort of i guess it mostly from japan sort of the giant robot the giant manned robot uh genre sub-genre is also a very strong um more in the um more in anime i'd say although right. you have you have things like ultraman don't you which sort of cross the <laughs> somewhere in between but he's, yeah. he's he's melding together a whole bunch of ideas that are mostly seen in japanese science fiction and therefore usually manga and anime and and melding at this sort of this these these two worlds together which do cross over occasionally but they they tend to be cinematically very different things yeah definitely i mean obviously you'd actually said already you've got giant robots um they do more traditionally appear in in anime uh, and the class is giant mecha um obviously when you've got things like ultraman he sort of like falls in that that gray area because obviously he fights kaiju so he fights giant monsters um, and we tend to refer to those shows as being uh, Super Takasetsu, uh, which is uh, basically special effects shows. Uh, so things like Power Rangers and Beetleborgs over here and Kamen Rider, they're all they're all the classed as those sorts of shows. But you, they're all basically have so much crossover because, as I said, these characters are fighting giant monsters and they're using giant robots. So it all, all three genres, even though they can be classed as their own things, they all do have this this large amount of crossover and certainly this is what del doro's uh bringing bringing in here i mean these are giant manned robots and they're fighting basically giant uh these giant monsters as well it's just he's adding a little more grounding to the world because i think with western it comes to western audiences they need a little more explanation of why things are the way they are and i think also at the same time he's adding these little fanboy sort of traits when he like talks about the black market for kaiju parts mm. um where we got hannibal chow uh him <laughs> by ron perlman who's basically he's uh basically uh doing a deal with with strikers sort of like skeleton crew so they're they're providing funding for them and in return they, he gets access to all sort of like the kaiju parts that he needs and i think those were the, those are the nice little touches that del toro puts in the fact that you know it's not just a case of, oh, monsters vanquished, you know, it just disappears. It's like, no, it's like, what happens? Because, I mean, it's, you're left with this giant carcass, so surely it has some purpose. And he's sort of like, when we're introduced to, obviously, Hannibal Chow, and he, like, basically explains that, like, every part of the kaiju could be used for some purpose from its, like, dung can be used for fertilizer because it's high in phosphorus, and, like, the horn is used as an impotence cure, and all these different little uh, bits and pieces. And I love how we see like uh, the remains of the kaiju in, in these shots in Black Phoenix, like Hong Kong, um, yeah. where you've got like the Buddhist temple and they've turned it into the shrine because they feel that the kaiju are this punishment from God uh, for our mis- misdemeanors. So. To be fair, nothing there looks like Hong Kong, except for when they do like a far shot from it. Like there's like one really far shot and you look down and it's like they took, they took, a, I don't know, that, that was the closest thing that ever was, was, was similar. To. I, I was thinking that I was thinking Hong Kong would last about two steps, wouldn't it? Hong Kong Island. I mean, it would just, <laughs> <laughs> they have this great big battle in, in, on um, rabbiteering downtown Hong Kong. I'm thinking, but pff, it's not that, that's, that's more like, um, sort of Beijing or somewhere, but, uh, the, 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 there's a bit of that i mean i will maybe get onto some issues with it later i guess but yeah i agree it didn't look like hong kong at all and the um and i push i appreciate it sort of in a in a near future setting but even when like charlie day's gone to again hong kong it that's not what it's like <laughs> yeah it's kind of like an alternate reality like something like Indeed. you know how you'd see in 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 you know um like uh, like a movie set in like I don't know nineteen. What was the Bullet Vanishes set in nineteen thirties? Yeah, like nineteen uh, thirties Shanghai was, with extra yeah, neon. Like 1930s yeah, Shanghai, sort of China, but they kind of like add this kind of more. Um, I guess more. Uh, there's a bit of more technology in there. I guess just to show that kind of futuristic sort of thing, that alternate reality. Um, but I really liked how, I like the going back to you know the the part where they're talking about um that every single part of 
the the kaiju is is you know there's some value to it and some use to it and i think that that ties in a lot with kind of like um the chinese culture which makes it really good to be used in kind of like a hong kong setting uh just just because those little details kind of it matches that scenario because you know Ch- chinese people don't like to you know they 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 have the black market back in the day of like selling everything um everything that's useful in as part of the animal and they believe a lot in like um you know certain parts of animals uh or certain like you use one part of the animal to make you more healthy in that part of your body pretty much yeah so i I, it was absolutely right that hannibal's area is behind a chinese medicine shop isn't it exactly that's that's it. That was that was perfect, and um, you know, it was leading me back to when I was in Hong Kong, and they made me eat turtle soup, turtle jelly for a sore throat, and it was like, oh my, most disgusting thing I've ever done. But you know, it's it's that's in the culture. I just, I just ate it the other day. <laughs> oh my god! I mean, like this isn't a, a cooking show. But what herbal, is that about? That herbal herbal jelly thing, right? That's right. And there's like shops everywhere. My friend said, oh, you've got a terrible cough. Come and have this herbal jelly. And I, and she didn't really tell me what it was. And then it dawned on me as I was eating this disgusting brown jelly with honey to make it palatable. <laughs> I realized, bitter, oh, yeah, this, this is like stewed turtle juice, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So to put the tingle back in your dingle. <laughs> this is the only maybe, maybe moment. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, let's just uh, take a moment. Let's have a look at the, obviously, the pilots here, because it's a real international crew that we have here. We've obviously got a bunch of English actors playing American actors, which doesn't sort of surprise me at this period, because it seemed that anyone who had any sort of talent in England was skipping over to America because there was no decent productions really happening in the UK, especially with the British book, BBC, you know. And their output. So obviously we got Charlie Hunnam and we got Idris Elba um, here, both playing Americans. I mean, Idris Elba here, he's sort of early into his career. He wasn't as well known as he is certainly now, but I think he, that man just oozes oozes charisma, and he's the sort of the glue that holds holds everything together for myself. Um, as Stack of Pentecost, who and just like basically, no matter how outlandish the concept get as long as he seemed to be like the one telling me and explaining it to me i was happy to go along with with whatever i was being told so and you know and he gives that he gives the speech at the end doesn't he you know today we stop the apocalypse i thought yeah that, he, i'd follow idris anywhere yeah <laughs> <laughs> i believe that of course we've also got burn gorman who's also english um Although he was born in America, but he's, he's, he's just Coronation Street alumni. Um, that's, um, putting on the strangest upper class accent ever. But uh, yeah, there are quite a lot of English people in here. And of course, the film didn't actually do so well, did it, in America? It did really well internationally, but in America it was okay. And I, th- I wonder if the lack of that big American star did hurt it a little bit. None of us are Americans, so we can say that, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was, I don't know if it, was, if it was that, I think the, just the concept itself, I knew that as soon as it went over to like, especially like in Japan where they obviously have this culture for these films, I knew it would, it, as soon as it got over there that it was going to do big business, which unsurprisingly it did. Um, mm-hmm. But because, especially when it comes to America, Americans seem to have this real sarky attitude when it comes to Godzilla movies, and I think it's this culture being brought up on MST3K where Whenever they look at like Godzilla movies, there's like so many snark casters out there who poke holes in Godzilla movies rather than appreciating them for the art that they are. And certainly, if we go over to Japan and the way they view the honor of being asked to direct a Godzilla movie, they view it the same as being a British director being asked to direct a James Bond movie. It's a very high honor to be asked to to uh, direct one of these films, and I think that's something that's obviously misses. Out on the American audiences who seem to view them as sort of like these hokey men in suits, you know, uh, monster-sized sort of Smackdown movies. And for ourselves here in the UK, we had such rot distribution of them. It's sort of like, it's always kind of like a treat if you manage to get hold of one or you you forked out the extra few multi-region players so you can import the missing volumes. Cause, um, so again, we, we never had a culture over here, so... It kind of reflects how it uh, sort of went here, and I think anyone who went to see it was just really going because 
be looking for sort of summer blockbuster fare rather than the fact that you know it's it's uh, it, it's robots fighting monsters, which is obviously my draw to this film. So, but I, I you know. It's kind of weird because, in some certain way, Pacific Rim is kind of very similar to that concept of Transformers, and yet Transformers did really well. And it's not—it's not even like, you know, it—it's not comparable in, as a film, as in like the just the quality of what's produced here. And yeah. I think that it has a lot to do with maybe the fact that, like you said, it was like there's, <laughs> like you guys said, there's not um, it's not a whole lot of Americans in this, uh, and. And it's the fact that you have a Spanish, uh, what, a Mexican director? Spanish director? I don't remember what you call it. Uh, where's Guillermo del Toro from? <laughs> He's Mexican. Um, yeah, like the, a Mexican director behind a kaiju-style film. And that seems like, it's kind of like fusion, but foreign someone doing fusion? <laughs> I don't know. Um, maybe that's that's another thing that kind of got in the way. Um, I, I didn't know how well Pacific Rim did. I mean, I know I knew it would do well in Asia because, especially in China, this kind of yeah, stuff did, is like, did is like funny. Yeah, in China. I love it. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> it's the kind of film they can't seem to do themselves, which is why Transformers films are always massive in China. I mean, I, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't a flop in America, but it really didn't do the business they're expecting it to do. Well, it's 190 million for the budget. Return to box office of 411 million. So, as long as you make back double your budget, then you got you're considered to have a hit because you basically got the budget of the film, and then you've got the same again, which is your advertising budget. So, if you're making making over double then you've got you consider it yeah hit. but yeah but then i mean 411 million is worldwide so 114 of that according to wikipedia yeah, like made, china alone it so, made less than 100 million in 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 uh, in america yeah so and i think when, <laughs> when it comes to transformers though transformers gets to play off the nostalgia because you know as kids we grew up with transformers and now as an adult it's sort of like Oh, remember that thing you liked as a kid? Here, go see Michael Bay do a multi-billion dollar version of it. Or he blows up everything, yeah. Yeah, and I love, I mean, that's what I love about... It's on my childhood. Yeah. Oh, fuck. It, <laughs> it so annoys me when people go, oh, they destroy my childhood. No, it doesn't destroy your childhood because your thing from your childhood is still there. It's not like we li- we delete that thing to bring in this new thing and... Oh, no, I just delete a new thing. There is one Transformers movie, and <laughs> and it's an animated one, and I'm fine with that. <laughs> okay. But we digress. <laughs> yeah, back to Pacific Rim. Okay. <laughs> Where were we? Um, yes. Well, the character of Pentecost was at one point offered to Tom Cruise, which I think would have been really amusing because he's only a short little fellow. So to see have like a guy who's about five six. Um, say we're going to postpone the apocalypse. Not sure if it's going to be. It's like okay, little man. <laughs> well, I mean, when they do a film, a film like that, if it was a shorter person, from what I understand, they would do like a lower angle and pan it up, and he'd look <laughs> really big, up. playing with the camera. You know, that's, that's what it is. <laughs> what, are you, what are you going to do? Get him a booster seat for his for his Jager. God. I shouldn't really say that. Yeah, we're the same Cause, height. Cause... So. And, and also, Rinko's not exactly huge, is she? So, oh, but Rinko is... I love Rinko so much. She's just so fantastic in this because she's got this naive innocence to her, yet at the same time, she's, a, she's an ass-kicker. And I was so... I mean, this is the thing. We all, I think when we all saw her in this film, we were fully expecting when they were doing Ghost in the Shell, the live-action version, that she would play the major um, and not Scarlett Johansson. There was a little bit of disappointment there, but no, uh, Rinko is, I mean, are we familiar with her work at all? Because I, I mean, I first came to sort of know her through Babel, um, and she was also in Survival Style 5, and I believe she's in, is it, uh, can we call the Treasure Hunter? Yeah. Oh, she's, I uh, she's, it's an amazing film, that is. Um, she's in um, Norwegian Wood. And she's in that Polish, China, uh, Japanese, uh, Salt Girls, if you've seen that. Yep. She's also in that, which is like, it's got um, 
a, a weird, it's a Japanese film, but funded with Polish money. Just, I, I don't yeah. really understand that. Um, so, but this was sort of 2013, 2014. It looked like she was going to sort of break out. She had Pacific Rim. She had that dreadful 47 Ronin film. You know, she had two big Hollywood and a lovely independent film in Kamika mm-hmm. the Treasure Hunter. Yeah. But it hasn't really moved on for her since then, surprisingly. I thought she was yeah. going to be one of these sort of breakthrough pan world I, actresses. You know, I, I feel like, you know, I, I feel like it's sad that she didn't. Because, I mean, Kumiko, I think, was a really good movie, but it was really weird. Like, it was super weird. And it's so weird that it matches her character so much. And sometimes I feel like when someone chooses a role like that and it works so well for her that you get kind of pinned up in this, like, indie sort of style. Because it is very indie. Um, I don't know. I really like, 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 I really like Kumiko a lot. Um, As I... I think I didn't like, I thought it was really weird, and then I had some issues with it, and then and then as I thought, back, the more I thought about it before I wrote the review of it, I started thinking about how amazing all these little things were that they did, and, and just how it fit together, and how such a ridiculous idea came together, and someone, like, so naive believed in it, right? But we're not reviewing Kimiko, so I'm not going to go any further into it. Okay, I mean, the character Mako, I think she's really... Well, it's just really a great character and she's really well developed throughout the film I mean Del Toro says that he went out of his way to make her not just you know the traditional sex kissing role so she wasn't there in like cut off shorts and the tank top mm. like a Megan Fox would um, and she's got this really great link to Pentecost because obviously she's his adopted daughter and we get to see the scenes of her as a child uh, where she was being pursued by well, the kaiju and how he came to adopt her. And um, the scenes with Little Mako, um, performed by uh, Mana Ashida, who is, I don't know what it is about uh, little little um, Asian actresses, but they, when we see like a Asian child actress, they always nail it. And whenever we see like uh, one of these Hollywood teens, they're just god awful. So, there, there does seem to be like a factory line of these fantastic five to nine year old well, we saw it in the Korean Meg. and Japanese actresses. <laughs> it's like amazing. I know we saw it in the Meg, um, the uh, the little girl in there. She was awesome, and uh, again, again with her little Mako here, she's really great. And I think there's a really cute story that when she was on set, she couldn't pronounce Guillermo del Toro's name, so he gave a special permission for her to call him uh, Totoro's son. Oh bless! <laughs> <laughs> that, but that scene, that 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 sort of scene where it's, it's like silent, and you see this little girl running down the street, and then she turns around, and there's a kaiju following. I remember seeing that in the cinema. Oh, just that's like one of my favourite scenes in cinema. The sort of the the quietness and the loudness, and her tears look real, and uh, and and just the fear in that that young child. And I just think that that. It's a moment of quiet but noise, and it really affected me. I just thought that that's just like one of my favourite scenes in cinema ever. Yeah, and I would say the whole sort of set, the way that they sort of set that whole sequence, so it's all on hydraulics, so everything shakes, and it really gives a sort of presence that you know of these giant monsters, like what it would feel like to be on street level, and you've got this giant monster sort of stomping around to see the big uh, Jager robot being flown in, just. Again, it's just these little details and how he constructs this universe, how everything interacts with each other, and that he can work in the more fantastical elements, such as we see during the in the Hong Kong battle, where we see uh, the the Jager fist like go through the building and it slows down and taps the the stress balls. Oh, the old Newton's cradle, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just the fact that he can, Dota was able to give us this vision on like such a big scale and then just like zoom it down into like the smallest little details. Everything has such like a, a flow and a finesse to it that we just wouldn't expect from an action pitch like this. You would expect it just to be more sort of like clunky and just about big moments. But here he's, he takes the moments to sort of like slow it down and zoom in and focus on the little details as well as, you know, the big payoff sequences. But yeah, I mean the character of Mako, I mean, again, Del Toro, commented that uh, Rinko's performance when they were doing obviously the Jager sequences that 
the, a lot of the cast would get like really burnt out because obviously it was like really intensive harness work and the fact that she never complained and he asked her what her secret was and she said that she just bought gummy bears and flowers and he responded that I try to do that in my life now. And who's to say I don't already? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, now on top of the, the background sort of characters here, we've got this amazing double team actor of Charlie Day as uh, Dr. Newt Giesler and uh, Ben Gorman as Dr. Herman Gottlieb, who are these sort of counter intellects to each other. One's a biologist, the other's a, a, um, a theorist. And in fact, they have this conflict in relationship where they're trying to outdo each other, and yeah, at the same time, they rely on each other to 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 do the to do their job. Um, it's a complete bromance, isn't it? <laughs> it is. I mean, I love Charlie Day because I'm a big fan of Always Sunny in Philadelphia, and it's it's funny the fact that both Del Toro and Ben Gorman have shown up in episodes of Always Sunny as well. But yeah, Charlie Day brings that manic energy, and here it really works for for the character Newt. The fact he's a self-confessed kaiju groupie. The fact he's fascinated with these <laughs> monsters that he tattoos his arms with them and he's just like, wants to know all these details about them despite them being these like horrible creatures of mass destruction and death. Um, he still has this like obsession with them. It's, I think he's kind of there to represent all the kaiju fans. Exactly. He's very meta. Um, so. And it's just... I think that it's, it's it's so, like, their characters are so interesting. And they are they kind of add this, like, comic relief that the rest of, that kind of breaks through all of the serious um, world apocalypse sort of thing that's going on. Um, and all the little mysteries are going on. And then they have these, like, little bickering moments. And, um, and it really, and it really helps because one of them is, like, purely, like, uh, Gottlieb is more, like, super... Um, to the numbers and he's really serious and he he bases everything on facts and all his calculations are correct and he's whatever you know and and then you go to like um geisler and he and he has these like out of the world ideas which you never think and then he does something like he does something like he experiments on himself and it's really stupid um and but it turns out that you know the stupid things turn out to be right and rather useful rather i don't know, con- contributes quite a bit to the whole cause um with its with with its you know repercussions obviously so i i, I thought it's really interesting because that the, the pair of them could have been very grating and they could have been yeah. tonally incompatible with the rest of the movie mm-hmm. or it, it could have or, or del toro could have used them much more sparingly and they would have just been that like, like you say like comic relief but because they give Day all those extra scenes with Ron Perlman and, you know, he gets a significant amount of screen time with a proper, you know, you, you're right. It actually moves the movie forward, doesn't it? And and it moves the plot forward. And I think by Del Toro giving those characters, certainly Day's character, lots of room to shine and actually have his own path. I think it works. I wonder if it I, I do think the film's maybe 20 minutes too long. And I do wonder the easy thing to do would be cut out a lot of Charlie Day. But I think it wouldn't be so successful then without it. I'm, I'm kind of torn on it. I, I think that I think that I, I, I actually enjoyed a lot of his scenes. Like, I, I do think the film is... Um, I, I remember at a certain point I did look at my watch and I was like, oh, when is this going to end, right? Um, but I, I really wouldn't cut out the Charlie Day part, mostly because... It is very useful, and it was really smart the way they used it, um, especially when he had that, um, when he kind of, like, um, did the drift with uh, that portion of the brain. And then it kind of hits you that, you know, like, before it hits them, obviously, that this is a two-way street. And whatever he sees, the other person sees it also, because they're colonists. And I thought that was just so smart. And, um... And I don't have problems with Del Toro usually having a lot of characters because all his films um, that we've looked at to this point have a lot of like parallel storylines that work together. And a lot of times he manages them really well because he's able to use each of these characters really, um, you know, and not make them feel dispensable. They they all have their purpose in the film, whether uh, whether they get 10 scenes or five scenes, they always have like uh, whether no matter what it is, they will have their purpose. They're not stunt casting. They're 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 actual 
integral cogs in the plot moving it forward you're right um same in hellboy isn't it um you know there's a lot of the lot of balls being juggled in the air but you wouldn't want to lose any of those balls mm-hmm. yeah I and mean, certainly when we obviously talk about about it comes, i mean there are obviously a lot of characters here which i mean there, no character ever feels like disposable at all which uh, it's something that makes something all the more impactful than when we actually lose one and so then when we look at like the other pilots i mean obviously we've got uh we've got herc and uh chuck hansen with the father and son australian pilots of uh striker eureka and uh for some for some reason when i'm watching them i just really wish that they've been british and the sole reason being the fact that they have a bulldog and Back in World War Two, you would have a lot of these tank commanders, and that they, they would have like sort of status symbols like bulldogs. And I just thought it'd be really cool just to, if they were British, it would be like a throwback to World War Two tank commanders. To just the fact that you know here we've got this foreign sun team, and they've got this pet bulldog, and they're just uh, having all these sort of throwbacks to like the wars of old. And um, again, this is where the where the international cash really sort of comes into its own because we've also got the Chinese triplets. Um, Charles, played by Chance Lu, uh, sorry, Charles Lance and Mark Lu, um, who play the Wee Tang triplets, who, I don't know about yourselves, but I, they seem kind of useless. <laughs> I wanted to see more. I mean, this is like going back to the bit at the beginning where I'd quite fancy seeing a prequel, because I didn't see enough of the Chinese guys, and I didn't see enough of the Russian pair, and their, you know, their robot was really... Oh, sorry, their mecha was really built up, and then it was barely in the thing, you know? <laughs> it's, I think that's... Uh, I, I think we lost half half our half our guys far too soon for my liking, but it wouldn't have worked as a film. So I, that's why I want to see a yeah. prequel. I want to see the adventures of the Russians. I love the uh, Kadanovskis. Uh, the fact that they're in a they're in a Mark One uh, Jager. So you can see the fact that we, when we look at obviously the the difference of the eras for the for these Jagers and the fact that. We've got Striker Yuriku, who's like the latest model, so it's like really fast and advanced. And then we've got this, this first era, what sort of Jager, which is just like this big clunky monster. This is all about brute force. And I love like when you look at the insides of the different uh, craft and they're all completely sort of different. And how with the Russian one, it's got all the, like this face mask that uh, come off. And it's like almost got like a night vision lens on them. So they were they were the ones I was especially like fun job but when it came to like the the triplets <laughs> whatever they were trying to do with like the multi-limbed uh jager it just seemed pretty useless and ineffective it was sort of like uh it looked real fancy but it didn't seem too effective yeah i'll quite agree with you there <laughs> <laughs> um but when it, i mean when it came to obviously designing the kaiju and uh the jager robots i mean they were creating about 100 a week and they this, the crew basically came together and voted it kind of like American Idol style. Um, <laughs> so if you get the art book, you can see a lot of the designs that didn't make it. And I think you could just have an, an art book just with the unused designs. And knowing Del Toro and being such a visual mind that it is, it probably would have been really cool to see some of the designs he came out with. And so when we look at the Kaiju in particular, you can see that a lot of them have very sort of animalistic sort of uh, qualities to them. Like you see elements like Bat and the Gorilla in in the two that we see in the Hong Kong sequence and just that, that, that whole fight sequence in particular, I mean, the way it constantly surprises you, the fact that you think, you know, what's going on and you've got these sort of monsters worked out and then, Oh, wait a minute. It can fly. <laughs> um, which I thought was just such a nice touch. So like, I didn't know it could do that. But I think that that's, I think that all has to do with like just Del Toro being at the helm of this project where his ideas is always kind of like he always has kind of like this twist to everything that he does. And it you never see it in advance. And I, that's part of his genius. And that's part of like just why he's so loved as as a director and as a as a as a writer as well for all his like all the stories that he's written. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean. Who else would have thought to cast Ellen McLean, the voice of uh, the voice of the uh, computer in Portal, as the uh, as the gypsy AI? <laughs> Which I thought was a real sort of little sort of thing. But obviously, I just being a Portal fan, I just kept expecting to like go on about offering cake uh, all the time. That sequence was going every time I heard their voice command. So now with obviously the action sort of sequences here, it's 
I mean, I, I personally think they're really so sort of beautifully shot. Um, the the fact that he shoots scenes at night and with rain, he's just not, it's just such a as so many sort of visual touches when you see like how the rain like bounces off the off these uh, these robots in particular, and certainly when you see like the movements and just how the rain sort of like affects it on it. And I know some people said that when it comes to like the fight scene, it got a little too sort of like janky with like. The fact that uh, we got scenes with like the Jago being thrown for the air and it's sort of like rag dolls for the air and that upset a few people. But how did uh, you guys find the uh, sort of action sequences? I thought the action sequences were fine. I thought, like you say, there's some brilliant detail in there. I did tire of every action scene happening at night in the rain because I couldn't always make out what was going on. And I've got to say, I'm not a huge fan of the stylistic choice. And the same is true of the recent Godzilla film as well, where there's these sort of lines of energy that are kind of helping you make out the, the, the sort of the, the, the basic where everything is on the monsters. Um, it's not, it's not a visual thing that pleases me. And I'd, I would have rather seen some variety in how the monsters appear. There are bits of it. Like when we first see the very first Kaiju, it's obviously in daylight and he's smashing the, the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, but but fight wise, all seem to happen knee deep in the sea, and there's a storm coming down, and you can't really work out what's going on. The one, I guess, the one fight which changed up a bit was in downtown New Hong Kong, with uh, <laughs> with all the neon signs and everything around, where it was much better lit, and you could sort of see what was going on. Yeah. No, I mean, I understand what you're coming from. I think that. Um... You know, when we had that big scene with, like, the the three um, Jaggers getting into the thing and they're fighting, what, uh, is it two kaijus at the same time or something? And, and was it that one? I don't remember anymore. <laughs> Details are not my forte. Uh, yeah, so anyways, no, when the three, the Germans and then the Chinese and and then you had the Herc and, um, in the background, right? With uh, Striker Eureka in the background. Yeah. Um, I got so confused. I was like, I was like, what's going on? I was like, I don't, I was like, okay, well, I guess they're down. And I guess they're down. <laughs> I was so confused. I, I just, um, no, I, the, there, it gets a bit like chaotic, I think, but there is a lot of style in the scenes and um, there's a lot of like little things that are, you know, there's a little things that are going on. I don't have problems with like the whole throwing them in the air and stuff like that. Like, I don't, I don't think that, like, I think, I think it's pretty cool when they do it like that. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of cool elements to it. Um, I mean, and of course they're, they're they're riffing on kaiju movies, which was guys in rubber suits yeah. rolling around cardboard cities. Yeah, so so um, the, the the kaiju which eventually gives birth to the baby. Yeah. Um, when that's attacking, there's no actually there's no um, mecha around at that time. Um, with that, that that that's got some sort of heft to it and it's rolling about and it does look a bit like a guy in a suit and i kind of like that i kind of like that he was he wasn't totally it wasn't like all cgi and super scientific sometimes it did feel a little bit like hey there's these other movies that i'm riffing on here and it looks a bit like this but i can do it better And I mean, I, I just like the way that Del Toro chooses to shoot these these action sequences because I mean he's a self confessed pacifist. So to see these, how he's uh, obviously choosing to shoot action, and we've seen it obviously in like films like with Hellboy as well, how his uh, approach to violence and that, and the fact that he's more so interested in the destruction than the actual collateral damage that goes with it. And as such, we see in the scenes of like people going into into like the emergency bunkers so that they're not going to get crushed by monsters um i mean it's only like miku's character is like the only sort of human that we see on sort of like ground level that you know has potential of being stood on um and it's such an interesting sort of approach i mean he even avoids like military terminology and that's where we have like the use of like ranger uh rather than you know like colonel and sergeant yeah marshal yeah Mm-hmm. Uh, which is just like really adds a, a new thing, and I mean, this idea that you he removes all these sort of like military sort of elements to it, so it's, it's not like giving this like army recruitment 
sort of vibe to it. Like when we look at the Transformers movies now, they just be feel like army recruitment videos. It's sort of like, oh look, here's the army solving all this problem. They got all this high tech gear. Whereas with this film, it's sort of like we've got a very sort of skeleton crew using what seemingly is sort of high tech gear, but we're not like throwing tons of firepower and tanks and planes and everything. It's just you know, it's these these like handful of uh, Jager pilots that uh, left to sort of battle these these monsters using what resources that they have since all their funding has been cut off at this point. Um, yeah, I mean, it's humanity's last stand, isn't it? And it, it also, I was thinking, if he had, if it had been more militaristic, I'd have been thinking Starship Troopers, and I'd have been trying to read something else into it which isn't there. The, 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 this is a very simplistic story that is about people working together to to win not about any i don't i don't see any other great subtext here about governments and military and he's he's, he's not making a he's not making a political movie he's making a love letter to kaiju and mecha movies isn't he oh definitely and he's... you know sorry karen come go no I, I really like how you said like this is a simplistic story because yeah. In my mind, I actually think this story is really straightforward. It's it's really simple. There's only one goal in this whole thing. And yes, there's all these like multiple storylines that happen. But in the end, it's really very focused on one goal. And that's saving the world from the kaiju. And you can, it, it, you can even call some of these parts rather predictable. They go into this kind of like uh, a really smooth flow of events. And everything fits together. But you would never call it kind of like... Like, I, I guess you can't call it predictable because it just makes sense that these things are happening. No, but, I mean, all the, all the story beats happen exactly as you think they'd happen. Yeah, exactly. What happens to every character, you can predict almost from yeah. the first minute you meet them. There's, there's a couple of things, but, you know, if the father and son reconciliation at the end, yeah. the, the, yeah, exactly. the, the Idris Elba's fate, um, uh, they try really hard to hide um, Rinko's relationship to Idris, but you know, it's not that well done. Um, it doesn't dwell. So there's things like um, Charlie Hunnam. We're meant to understand that he's been really damaged by what happened to him in the opening of the film, but we never really explore it, do we? It really is interested in getting from A to B and giving us a fun ride along the way, but there's no shocks or surprises. I don't think there certainly wasn't for me. And so even though it's simplistic, I think it's absolutely right that it is. Exactly. I think that that's the, that's, like that's one of those those little charms of of how like Del Toro makes this film, and in the end, like most people would, you know, pe- most people throw around, you know, um, you know, formula, formulaic, and predictable, and that's kind of like a bad term. But I think in some senses, like like a movie like this, being simplistic and straight to the point is really important, and it actually it actually helps the film to be a lot more enjoyable and just really entertaining to watch. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, is anyone got anything else that you want to talk about this one at all? Or? All right, I do have one thing to say, okay. <laughs> and there is one thing that's really annoyed me. Um, it's his grasp of science is whoever wrote the script. And I think Del Toro did it with, um, I can't remember who he did it with, uh, uh Travis Beachman. They need to go and get some scientific advisors because, A, being nuclear has nothing to do with being binary, uh, analog or digital. <laughs> and in fact, it's full of frigging digital because that's how the whole thing's working. Also, left brain and right brain don't control the left and right hand side of your body. <laughs> and what was the other? There was, a, there was a third thing. Oh, and people haven't thought that the dinosaurs have two brains for about 50 years. Um, but apart from that, Fine, but yeah, I think you have to hold your um. As for a science fiction film, its grasp of science was pretty fucking awful. <laughs> well, no, the left brain, right brain is so that it forms one complete brain between two pilots, so it takes it, it halves the mental strain on a pilot. No, no, that's that's what they say, and then they show a picture of left brains and right brains handling left and right <laughs> arms. <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a graphic comes up, and I'm thinking. I, I don't think that's what you meant. I absolutely understood what they meant about sharing the um, sharing the mental strain, but that's not how they showed it at that moment. They were explaining it. 
it, it's fine. It's fine. It's a. It's a. You know. It, it's a. The thing to remember is it isn't actually a science fiction movie. It's a kaiju movie, and I yeah. think you can separate those two things. But as Elwood is insistent on calling me the professor on our other podcast. I will bring this up. <laughs> it's scientific accuracy, including things like the physics, especially when they're underwater, is a bit dodgy. But it's still a huge amount of fun and a blast to watch. And yeah. in terms of the world building and the effort that went into it, I wish there was a prequel. I wish there was a TV series. I wish the sequel was good. I wish all sorts of things about it. But I'm glad I've got Pacific Rim. Okay, uh, well that obviously brings us on to further watching, and what do you sort of pair with this? I mean, obviously there is a sequel, you can watch Pacific Rim Uprising, which isn't bad. Um, mm-hmm. It's not as good as or as fun as this this first one, but it adds some new concepts, including the mini Jager robot, uh, which is pretty cool, and uh, the idea of a new training corps, but it throws in a lot of real complex items, such as uh, the fact that we got John Boyega who's playing Pentecost's son and he hasn't got the same sort of charisma that I just Elba brings to the role and gets involved in a real sort of clumsy love triangle that goes absolutely nowhere. <laughs> um, but, you know, it gives at least Newt gets the chance to shine um, and we get to see the return of uh, Mako, which is always welcome as well. So it's just, uh, it's just a shame that Del Toro didn't take on the project because from what he was like talking about, it had some really exciting ideas. It was going to be like a two-part film, um, and that like you would have Ferrari and make all the sort of like turn up at the end of the first part. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it was it was all these really cool ideas, and we never actually got to see any of it to fruition. So <laughs> talking about that, it always seems like um, Del Toro has these trilogies and whatnot, oh, yeah. and they never end up happening, and it always falls apart when it goes to the next thing. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go first for further viewing, because I'm gonna have the most normal ones. <laughs> I don't know what to use. So, um, my further viewing is, uh, for giant monsters, it would be Kong Skull Island, which I actually, when I first finished watching that one, I, uh, remember I messaged Elwood, and I asked him, is that considered a kaiju movie? <laughs> so, yeah, that's my choice for that. Um, and, uh, another is the one that we mentioned, and that's the Meg uh, just because there's a giant shark. And it's awesome. And and it, and it has similarity to the ideas of, like, the breach, um, which they mention in this one. In that one, it's it's that, you know, there there's, a, you know, there's, like, a cloud, and then blah, 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 and then that's the, the, the sharks are, the megalodons are, are below whatever by some air and whatever, and I'm not very good with science either, so I'm not going to go talk about that any further. <laughs> Yeah, they're, uh, the the idea that these prehistoric sharks and, and other prehistoric creatures have been kept alive in the Marina Trench, um, yeah. and that they've got this warm pocket created by the underwater volcanoes, and it's just this cold layer of water that basically keeps them from coming yeah. up to the surface, and it's only by humans putting their nose in where it's not supposed to be that uh, we obviously release them back into the food chain. So, yeah, mm-hmm. some fun ideas there, definitely. So. Are there further viewing? Stephen, is there anything you want to throw in there, Tom? Um, yeah, so I think I know what you're going to do. But um, i got two films. So one I've already mentioned, which was Starship Troopers. Okay. Which, um, yeah, I'd see as a companion piece to this. Obviously, obviously, there's not giant monsters and giant robots, although there are monsters. And there is uh, sort of the world fighting against an invasion of these monsters where the invasion region is a little... Um, uh, oblique shall we say um but for all sorts of different reasons i think that's a movie's a huge amount of fun i've always enjoyed it and i like watching the two of them together although they're trying to do completely different things and if i'm going to pick a kaiju movie i'm going to pick gamma garden of the universe because i'm a gamma fan and i know Elwood isn't <laughs> there was a getting word to gamma fan but if you had to pick Godzilla versus Gamera, I know where you'd go. It sounds so predictable. <laughs> and? Yeah, probably would. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just I get more I get more range with, Gam- with Godzilla than I do with Gamera. So, and just having a giant space turtle that's a friend to all children just makes zero sense. 
But he's, he turns, it turns into rocket spinning Catherine wheel <laughs> rocket legs. I mean, he's fantastic. He's also kind you... of a dick, as we saw in uh, in Gamma vs. Baragon, where he lands next to a dam and then knocks it over for no apparent reason. So there is that whole collateral damage aspect yes. of Gamera, especially the, the third one, the Revenge of Isis that we saw, which did remind me of that, that again, we'll talk about Hong Kong with rabbit ears again round, round it. It's uh, Gamera wrecks the joint, even though he's trying to do the right thing. Oh, she's trying to do the right thing. I'm never too sure if Gamera's a, ma- a girl or a boy. It is a he, is it? Yeah. Um, but you know, the collateral damage is a big part of that. And, and there was a lot of collateral damage done in this movie. Although, as you rightfully say, no one ever seems to be around to get hurt by it. Yeah. Um, okay. So, I mean, if you see, if you want to see more giant robots, I mean, definitely check out the anime plus the movie uh, directed by Maru Ishii. Uh, there's also the TV series as well, which is a little harder to get over here, but uh, definitely worth checking out. But the film itself is a really fun thriller with uh, giant mecha elements to it. Uh, you can also obviously check out the classic Gundam. Uh, whether you're watching the original series or my personal favourite Gundam Seed both uh, definitely gives you a giant robot fix there even though it is just you know giant robots fighting over giant robots um, obviously if you're in Kaiju I guess it's down to myself to cover the uh, Godzilla quota here I mean obviously for myself I mean I would would really sort of see, if you're new to Godzilla look at the Shiro period which is 1954 to 1975 um, here there's some really fun films. You've got things such as like Mothra vs. Godzilla, Terror and Mecha Godzilla, and my personal favorite, Destroy All Monsters, uh, which I'd certainly check out. If you want something a little darker, um, skip forward to like the Millennium Period, which is 1999 to 2004, and look at films such as like Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah, um, which has got a really fun origin story for, for Godzilla, and uh, sees King Ghidorah not only in his awesome form but also brought back as mecha king Ghidorah as well so um those are sort of like the sort of standout ones but really with the gods of the movies it they're all they're all good it's just some are better than others much like the alien saga so you can't really go wrong and you you can start anywhere in them they're all pretty much standalone movies i mean the original godzilla movie uh for 1954 is actually a pretty sober sort of movie and just a really intelligent masterpiece of uh, filmmaking, much like the original Mothra. Um, and just the approach that Hoda uh, approaches these movies and really sort of lays down the groundwork of how you would shoot kaiju movies and just really sort of establishes the use of low angles and just the sheer joy of uh, destroying Tokyo, uh, which is obviously the sort of like cornerstone of these movies. It's the fact that Tokyo gets destroyed in every movie and it's rebuilt by uh, the time we get through to the next one with little or no memory of these giant monsters ever stomping through there. So, but that would uh, be my my brief uh, overview of Godzilla for you. So, Kim, I mean, obviously, that was the Pacific Rim. Where does our journey take us next in the Del Toro filmography? We're going forward two years. Well, yeah, forward two years to 2015 with uh, Crimson Peak, which is a fantasy horror drama. Yep, and a first time watch for myself. So the next two films, both Crimson Peak and Shape of Water, are going to be first time watches for myself. So that's going to be exciting to see. And um, obviously, I'd, uh, before we do go, I'd like to obviously say uh, thank you to, uh, as always, my co-host Kim. So first, I'd like to say thank you to our special guest, Stephen, for joining us. And uh, Stephen, obviously, if people want to come and stalk you on the internet, where's the best place to come and find you? Well, thank you for the movie and the tea. It was very nice. You can find me on the internet all kinds of places. Um, You can find my writings at my own blog, although not much recently, at guelloramblings.wordpress.com. You'll find more of my reviews and articles and interviews at easternkicks.com. You'll find me on a little podcast called the Asian Cinema Film Club that I do with some other guy. can't remember his name. And I've got my own world cinema podcast, um, the Guano Ramblings World Tour, which is um, six or seven episodes in by the time this comes out, where I have 
very brief sort of uh, tasters of visit a different country every episode, pick a couple of films for your um, to, to, to put on your watch lists. Awesome. Um, well, again, thank you as always uh, for listening. If you haven't done already, please do hit the like or subscribe buttons wherever you happen to be listening to us. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter, uh, as well as uh, checking out our blog, which has got our complete uh, archive of movies. So, complete archive of not only our reviews, but also our podcast episodes. And you can find that at moviesandtpodcast.wordpress.com. Um, as I said, please do... Uh, if you're listening to the show, please leave us a review or wherever you happen to be listening to us. It really does help get the show a profile raised and, uh, you know, let your friends know. Spam your enemies and get the word out uh, there. As we always love to hear any feedback from you guys and uh, hopefully you've uh, enjoyed so far this uh, how this uh, season's gone and obviously our previous season before and Paul W. Sanson. But until uh, next time, obviously this wraps up another edition of Moves and Tea. Thank you as always for listening and uh, we'll be back next time looking at Crimson Peak.